Let's take a minute to talk about the device that changed mankind, the computer, and where it came from. Human beings have always been obsessed with counting things. When you were younger, you counted on your fingers or digits. Now, there's limits to what you can count on your fingers and what you can remember. So human beings started looking for solutions that could make counting and keeping track of things more efficient. First, they started with mechanical devices. And then, with the advent of electricity, they were able to create digital devices that led us to the computer of today. In the early times, there were mechanical devices that were used to assist in counting tasks, like the abacus, Napier's bones, and the slide rule. I've got a video that you're gonna watch and some activities that are gonna teach you how to use an abacus, or a Japanese abacus, which is called Soroban. If you've never done this before, this is very enlightening. It will give you some insight into what it must have been like to be an early human being and what counting devices were at your disposal. Remember, whenever you see one of these um, slides, you are to watch the video and make sure that you can answer the three guiding questions before you move on. We progressed as human beings into more complex mechanical devices like the calculating clock, the Pascaline, and many um, devices that Charles Babbage envisioned like the difference engine. The computer is really made possible by electricity. Mechanical, big, clumsy devices with huge moving parts were never going to get the job done. People soon realized that by harnessing the power of the electron, they could make electrical components to build a computer that was fast, small, and powerful. So the big idea is that all information inside a computer is stored as bits. And a bit is a fancy way of saying binary digit. Binary means a system that employs only ones and zeros to represent things. So each bit or binary digit is a one or a zero. If you string ones and zeros together, you can represent data of any kind. So inside a computer, you need to think of it as a series of electronic switches, just like in your house or apartment. If the switch is on, it's a one. If the switch is off, it's a zero. So at a very, very small level inside the computer, we're trying to create banks of electronic switches, each one that represents a one and a zero. When we string ones and zeros or binary digits together, we are able to represent information. We started off with clumsy things called relays, then vacuum tubes, then transistors, which represented these ones and zeros. These were the electronic switches. These are the components each which represents a one or zero. As you can see, the relays, those are pretty big. To represent a one or a zero, you'd have a humongous machine. Vacuum tubes, advanced technologies a little bit, but it wasn't until the transistor that the computer really came of age. If you were to take a closer look at either of these technologies, you will see that they very much are like an electronic switch, but it's the flow of electrons which turns the switch on or off. Here are some of the precursors to the modern computer. Each used these early technologies to represent ones and zeros. In 1941, German Conrad Zuse came up with the Z3, which had the electronic relays in it. The United States Army and the University of Pennsylvania, or Penn, came up with the ENIAC, which was a computer that was used to calculate ballistic missile tables, and it featured vacuum tubes. And then there was the Tradic, which was a joint venture between AT&T and the US Air Force, and it was the first fully transistorized computer. And you can see the differences just visually. They pop out to you. In this class, we're gonna be talking about Conrad Zusa. Um, I've got an activity and a video that I want you to watch about him and what motivated him to create one of the first computers in the world. I've also got a video that I want you to watch which explains the ENIAC the um, vacuum tube powered computer made at Penn or University of Pennsylvania to calculate ballistic missile tables. They have this machine still there or at least part of it and it's on display. So transistors, the electrical component found inside the Tradic is really what changed computers. We went from power hungry, unreliable things like relays and vacuum tubes to something that we really could start working with. A transistor is an electronic switch, so it has two states, an on, a one, or an off, a zero. Nowadays, we have miniaturized the idea of the transistor 
onto chips. And so now there are billions of transistors within a modern day processor, each which can be turned on and off, leveraging the power of electrons. I've got an article that you're going to be reading about what a transistor is and how it operates within a modern day computer. Beyond transistors, it's the idea of integrated circuitry which really propels the computer forward. In an integrated circuit, you take many separate discrete components and you combine them together. So as you can see in the picture here, you've got discrete or separate transistors on the left and then you have them all integrated into a single semiconductive chip. This allows us to miniaturize the computer and ultimately led to the computer in our homes and in every device imaginable. I've got an article about integrated circuitry as well, which explains what it is and its significance to the advancement of electronics and the computer. Computers progressed rapidly. In the 1950s through 1970s, people didn't have computers in their homes, but large institutions and employers have what were called mainframes. These mainframes were made by a handful of companies, the largest of which IBM, or International Business Machines, owned the market. These were large, power-hungry, expensive machines, well outside the reach of the regular, average, everyday Joe. Then came the microprocessor. By using integrated circuitry and advances in manufacturing technology, they were able to pack all the power of a computer onto a single semiconductive chip called a CPU, also known as a processor. This brain powers the computer and once it got small enough and affordable enough, we were able to get it into everyone's homes. It was Intel that was the company that produced the first commercially available microprocessor. That means you could go to the store and you could buy it. This was back in the early to mid 70s. So the co-founders of Intel, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, are considered the fathers of Silicon Valley. They call it Silicon Valley after the material, the semiconductive material that processors are made from. And it's aptly named because without the processor, there's no software industry, there's no high technology, there's no artificial intelligence, there's nothing. So in 1968, Intel was founded and this was an extremely important event. You'll see here one of the first processors from Intel, the 4004. It had 2300 transistors packed onto it and this is what it looked like under a microscope. Microprocessors just keep getting faster and faster. That's because we keep coming up with inventive ways to pack more and more transistors in ever smaller spaces. When it comes to the power or speed of a microprocessor, it's measured in what's called clock speed or frequency. The frequency indicates the number of instructions that that chip can accomplish in a second. For example, a three gigahertz processor should be able to process three billion instructions per second. With all of that great power at our disposal and with costs going down, the personal computer or PC revolution was imminent. Starting in the mid 70s, people could go to the store and build their own computer using hobbyist kits like this one. And the rest is history. The personal computer evolved from the Apple Ones and Apple Twos of the late 1970s to the powerful smartphone devices that you and I carry each day. It hasn't been easy, however, to keep up with this expectation that computers just get faster and faster. One way we've kept up is by creating special types of processors, like this multi-core processor. A multi-core processor is like having four CPUs on one chip. It allows you to divide up the work. There have been many different strategies like hyper-threading and multi-core processors that have allowed us to keep up with this expectation that computers get faster and faster. I have a video here that introduces you to this concept that computers should just keep getting faster and faster. It's called Moore's Law. Moore's Law was dubbed by co-founder of Intel, Gordon Moore, and it states that the number of transistors that we can pack onto a semiconductive chip should double roughly every two years. So put simply that the power of a computer microprocessor should double roughly every two years. This law, this prediction, held true from 1975 through 2012. As you can see in this line graph right here, we've done a pretty good job of keeping up with Moore's Law, at least until recently. And more broadly, since computers were envisioned, we have really been able to increase processing power and reduce cost. However, the future is very uncertain. Our ability to pack more and more transistors into smaller and smaller spaces is starting to wane. And just like we moved from the vacuum tube to the transistor to the integrated semiconductive chip, 
Now we need to move towards alternative materials and manufacturing processes. We need to get closer to the molecular level to put more and more of these electronic switches into smaller spaces. Now there's a lot of ideas about what a processor might look like in the future. Some people think we're going to be able to harness the power and the speed of light. Some people think that there are better materials we can use, like carbon-based graphene. But one thing is for certain, the future is unknown. It'll be exciting to see what the future holds.